What's going on, guys? Coming to y'all with another deck tech video. This one's going to be on uh, my Arlen Cord commander deck. Uh, I know that Arlen Cord is not a technical legal commander. Uh, however, she's a lot of fun to play with until we get a legendary werewolf, and it just, just feels like such a flavor win to use her as the commander. Uh, if and when we ever do get a legendary werewolf, I'll happily swap her out. Uh, but until then, uh, she'll be leading the pack, as it were. Okay, so Arlen Cord is a four mana walker, two a red and a green. Uh, for a three loyalty planeswalker, her plus one is until end of turn up to one target creature gets plus two plus two, gains vigilance and haste. And you can pay zero to put out a two two wolf and then transform her. And when she transforms, she becomes Arlen embraced by the moon. Her plus one is creatures you control get one one and gain trample till end of turn. Her minus one allows her to deal three damage to a creature or player and then transform back into uh, Arlen Cord. And then her minus six, if we can ever get there, gives us an emblem with creatures we control have haste and tap to deal damage equal to their power to target creature or player. So basically if we get her ultimate off, we can kind of win the game if we have a decent board state. Uh, she's not a super amazing commander, to be perfectly honest, but she's definitely a lot of fun. Okay, let's go ahead and get into the mana base real quick. Command tower, uh, standard included in any uh, multicolored commander deck. Reflecting pool is just hopefully another source of red and or green um, that comes into play untapped. Uh, Wooded Foothills, it's our fetch land. We can pay one uh, tap sack, pay one life, go find one of the following three cards, uh, which are uh, Taiga, the original dual land, Stomping Ground, which is obviously our shock land, or a Cinder Glade, which is our Tango land. Yes, Tango land, not have land, not battle land, Tango land. Um, they can all be fetched with the Wooded Foothills. Game Trail, our stripper land. Um, as we like to call them, comes into play untapped as long as we reveal a mountain or forest from hand. The best part about this is that we don't have to reveal a basic. We can reveal uh, one of the three lands we showed before, the duel, the shock, or the tango, and it'll come, in, uh, come into play untapped just the same. Painland, uh, card pollution forest. Uh, it's commander, the one life is negligible, to be perfectly honest with you. Uh, go over the Burn Willows, which is our future site land. Uh, it's kind of the inverse of a pain land, and then it gives all of opponents uh, one life when we tap it for red or green. But again, it's commander, that one life is highly negligible. Uh, Buddy Land, Rootbound Crag. We have both of our filter lands, Moss Fire Valley and Firelit Thicket. Um, they just go ahead and filter into the colors we need. The Moss Fire being strictly worse, it just acts basically as a gruel signet. Still highly worth including in these builds. I really, really do feel like the old filters are highly underplayed. Hopefully the Galera isn't hitting us too hard. Uh, Temple of Abandon, our Scrylands. Um, Scrylands are a little bit slow, but I tend to try to include them in my two-color decks, not so much in my three-color decks. Uh, but here, the top deck manipulation is appreciated. Uh, storage land in the form of Fungal Reaches. Uh, just dump our extra mana into this at the end of uh, the final opponent's turn. Uh, over time, we can just accumulate a large amount of mana that we can use to just blow our, uh, hopefully blow our opponents out and win the game. Gruel Turf, Bounce Land, pretty standard. Uh, into the non-dual lands, we have Gaia's Cradle. Uh, we do end up flooding the board as often as we can because we are playing green after all. So Cradle allows us to just generate a massive amount of green mana. Both Wasteland and Strip Mine. Um, by the way, just like Gaia's Cradle, I didn't mention this. If you're trying to stay budget, you can actually buy these in Gold Border. Uh, Gaia's Cradle, Wasteland, and Strip Mine. You can get them all in Gold Border for a fraction of the cost. I think a Gold Border Cradle is like 30 bucks. Gold Bordered Wasteland is five, and a Gold Border Strip Mine is like three. Uh, in addition to that, if you can't afford uh, Taiga, you can get one from Collector's Edition for I think it's around 60 or 70 bucks right now. So if you're on a budget, you can still afford to play these cards in some way, shape, or form. Uh, same thing goes for Ancient Tomb. Um, great land, and you can also get it in Gold Border for uh, I think it's around two dollars. Uh, easily worth it. If you're on a budget, there's no reason not to play with the gold border cards. They are actual Magic the Gathering cards, and as long as your sleeves are fully opaque, it shouldn't be an issue. Uh, Keswick Wolf Run, we can give creatures plus X plus O and Trample on the turn. Uh, it's a flavor include for the most part, but it is also a decent land. Landscape, uh, I try to include this in as many of my two color decks and mono color decks as I can. It just ramps us, uh, which certain colors have an issue with. Granted, we're in green, but still, sometimes we have extra mana and we just want to go ahead and spend it. And then we have nine basic forests. And we have five basic mountains. Okay, so that does it for the lands of the deck. Uh, mana rocks, we don't have too many, but we do have a few. Uh, mana crypts, pretty standard include if you can afford it. 
Soul Ring, this one's actually a horribly miscut, uh, horribly poorly cut uh, collect a collector's edition Soul Ring, but my friend Jordan sent it to me and I figured, you know what, it's still the Soul Ring, we still should play it, it still needs a home, and it went ahead and threw it in here because I like the art. Uh, but Soul Ring, standard including Commander. Gruel Signet, uh, we're playing Red Green, so we generally do want to include our Signets, I feel. I know some folks don't like them, but I personally am a big fan of the Signets in Commander decks. Fell War Stone. Uh, this deck was actually built to go up in a four-way match against uh, three of my friends, one of which playing Black Red Vampires, the other playing Blue, uh, blue Black Zombies, and the final playing Green White Humans. So hopefully, we, even though we haven't gotten the game started going yet, uh, Fell War Stone should almost consistently provide red or green mana to me. So, great rock to have it too. Uh, Coalition Relic, one of the best mana rocks in the game. Tap for a colorless, and we can also tap it, put a charge counter on it. Then at our pre-combat main phase, we can remove all charge counters on it and add one mana of any, uh, of any color to our mana pool for each charge counter revealed, uh, removed this way. So, basically every other turn it provides two. Not bad. Into our creatures, we have Village Messenger. It is a 1-1 one, one haste for one that turns into a 3-2, uh, sorry, a 2-2 two, two menace. Reckless Waif is a 1-1 a one, one for 1 red that turns into a 3-2 with no abilities. Wolf Bitten Captive is a 1-1 one, one for 1 green that we can pay 1 and a green to pump plus 2 plus 2 until end of turn. Use only once per turn. That flips into a 2-2. Two, two. We can pay 3 and a green to pump it plus 4 plus 4 until end of turn. Again, only use it once uh, per turn. Scorn Villager is a 1-1 one, one for 1 and a green that turns into uh, the taps for a green mana. It turns into a 2-2 two, two Vigilance that taps to add 2 green to our mana pool. Duskwatch Recruiter is a new include from Shadows Over Innistrad. It is a 2-2 two, two for 2. We can pay 2 and a green. Look at the top 3 cards of our library, reveal the creature, put it into our hand, and put the rest of the bottom of our library. Which turns into a 3-3 three, three that makes our creatures cost 1 less to cast. Keswick Forge Master is a 2-1 two, for 2. 1 and a red. Uh, whenever it blocks or becomes blocked by a creature, it deals that 1 damage to that creature. And it transforms into a 3-2 uh, that has the same ability, except it will deal 2 damage to the creature instead of 1. Mayor of Avabrook pumps other humans plus one plus one and is a one one for one and a green. That transforms into a three three that pumps other wolves and werewolves plus one plus one and every end step will make us a two two wolf token. Immerwolf is probably the best creature we can ever hope for and we really just want to see a legendary version of it. My group was nice enough to let me play with it as commander for a while <laughs> and uh, I quickly changed that just because it was slightly overpowering with the flip side of the werewolves and it just felt so wrong using a non-legendary creature as my commander. But still, it's a 2-2 two, two for 3, 1 green-red with Intimidate, pumps our other wolves and werewolves 1-1 one, one, and prevents our non-human werewolves from ever transforming back. So, standard include into any werewolf deck. Uh, Adaptive Automaton, uh, it's going to come down and name Werewolf and Pumper Other Werewolves 1 1. Crewman Outlaw is a 2 2 first strike for 3. Um, and if I remember correctly, this one transforms to give Menace. Let me go ahead and make sure. Yep, it turns into a 3 3 double strike that uh, gives our other werewolves, or all of our werewolves, Menace. Which is definitely not nothing. I uh, actually really like this guy when he's transformed. Gaia Reach Bandit is another really sweet werewolf that was given to us in Shadows. It's a 3-2 haste for 3, uh, 2 and a red. With, I'm uh, sorry, it transforms into a 4-3, and it has, whenever you cast a werewolf creature spell, or sorry, whenever a werewolf comes into play under your control, you may transform it, I believe is the wording. Uh, just insane. Targan Mauler is a werewolf by technicality, 2-2 uh -huh. two, two for 2 and a red. Changeling, so it has all creature types, and whenever an opponent casts a spell, it gets a woman counter, so it just kind of puts some penalty on our opponent's casting spells, which maybe uh, will allow us to transform some of our werewolves at some point in the game. Silver for Partisan is a 2 2 for 2 and a green with Trample. Whenever a wolf or werewolf we control becomes a target of an instant or sorcery spell, we may put a 2 2 green wolf token into play. Uh, so, not bad. Uh, it kind of makes our opponent, maybe it'll make our opponents hesitant to target us. Uh, it's kind of fun if you're playing Plane Chase with it because then you can um, have Glimmerboard Basin in play. And if someone goes to Doomblade your board, then you at least get as many, uh, however many wolves and werewolves you have, you'll be left with that many wolf tokens. Uh, which is, it's fun. It's not nothing. Rot Wolf is a 2 2 for 2 and a green with Infect. And whenever a creature dealt damage by Rot Wolf this turn dies, uh, you may draw a card. So it's mostly card draw, and the Infect can be a secondary win condition with an overrun effect. Not terrible. Uh, Lampold Elder is a 1-2 for 2 and a green that transforms into a 4-5 uh, 
and I believe it draws us a card whenever it damages an opponent. Yep, whenever it deals combat damage to a player, we draw a card. Not super familiar with all these werewolves yet. This is still somewhat of a new deck, so uh, hopefully they'll be patient with me. Uh, Wolfie Revenger is a 3-3 for 1 and 2 green with flash, and we can pay 1 and a green to regenerate it. Uh, not super impressive. It may end up getting the cut, uh, just because it doesn't do a whole hell of a lot. Uh, but for now, it just makes a decent chump lock that they don't expect. Hermit of the Natternoles is a 2-3 for 2 and a green, with whenever an opponent casts a spell during our turn, we draw a card. And it turns into a 3-5. This says when an opponent casts a spell during our turn, we may draw two cards. Sorry, we do draw two cards. So again, it's just putting some more penalty on our opponent's casting spells. Uh, we're trying to keep them from forcing our werewolves to transform. Breakneck Rider is a 3-3 for one and double red. That transforms into a 4-3. Uh, that gives our attacking creatures plus one, plus zero, and trample. So, you know, just trying to pump our field a little bit bigger since our werewolves aren't necessarily the biggest. Um... I find a lot of the time I don't ever actually get to transform any or most of these um, very often, so I kind of had to fight with their human side, which is why I'm trying to make sure their human side is also still playable. A 3-3 three, three for 3 is not uh, god-awful. Not amazing, but not god-awful. Pirate Hurt Wolf is another one of our fa one of my favorites. Uh, costs 2 and a red for a 1-1 one, one with Undying, and whenever it attacks, our creatures gain menace until end of turn, which is, again, not nothing. This card has just won me quite a few games, and it's been the bane of a few of my friends. Daybreak Ranger is a 2-2 for 2 and a green, that can pat, deal 2 damage to target creature with flying, it transforms into a 4-4 that we can pay a red and tap to have it fight target creature. Huntmaster of the Fells is a 2-2 for 2, a red and a green, with when it enters the battlefield or transforms into Huntmaster of the Fells, we get a 2-2 green wolf token and gain 2 life, and its flip side, whoops, what are you doing upside down? Its flip side is a 4-4, Trample, with whenever it uh, transforms into the Ravager of the Fells, it deals 2 damage to target opponent, and 2 damage to up to 1 target creature they control. So it's one of the few werewolves that we actually don't mind if it flips back and forth and back and forth. Uh, generally, we want our werewolves to stay on their werewolf side if we can, but this one we can actually deal with it if it does end up flipping back and forth. Instigator Gang is a 2-3 three for 3 and a red We can uh, that gives our attacking creatures plus 1, plus 0. Oh. And its flip side is a 5-5 five five that gives our attacking creatures plus 3, plus 0. Oh. And I think, yep, it also has Trample. So much flipping. Okay, um, make sure the glare isn't hitting us too hard. Mundronian Shaman is a 3-2 three for 3 and a red that transforms into a 5-5. Five five it says, whenever an opponent casts a spell, Tovalor's Mage Hunter deals 2 damage to that player. So again, we're putting some penalty on them casting spells, um, hoping that that'll allow them to, or force them to no longer cast things to transform our werewolves. Chameleon, uh, Chameleon Colossus is another technical werewolf. It is a 4-4 four, four for 2 and 2 green with changeling and protection from black. We can pay 2 and 2 green to give it plus X plus X until end of turn where X is its power. So if we have a lot of mana, we can just dump it into this and um, try to blow our opponents out with it. Master of the Hunt. This card is terrible, but I wanted to run it anyways. I actually had custom tokens made for it. Um, as you can see here, done by the proxy guy on Twitter. Um, but it's a 2-2 two, two for 2 and 2 green that we can pay 2 and 2 green to make a 1-1 a one, one wolf token named Wolves of the Hunt that has banding with other creatures named Wolves of the Hunt. So it's just a mana dump card, and it's pretty bad, but I still love it, and I still uh, refuse to take it out. Now, Master of the Wild Hunt is nothing to scoff at. A 3-3 three, three for 2 and 2 green that every upkeep will get a 2-2 two, two wolf token, and we can tap all of our untapped wolves to have each of the one of those wolves deal damage equal to its power to target creature. Then that creature's controller can deal damage uh, divided as its controller chooses amongst any number of those wolves. So it can just end up wiping out a problem creature that we have an issue with and we may lose, you know, two or three wolves over it. Not a huge deal. Wolfier Silverheart is a 4-4 four, four for three and two green with Soul Bond and as long as it's uh, paired with another creature, each of those creatures gets plus four, plus four. <laughs> so it essentially is an 8-8 eight, eight for five that pumps another creature 4-4. Four, four. Pretty basic, but not bad. Sage of Ancient Lore is one I'm actually considering cutting already. Uh, it's a star star for four and a green. It's power and toughness equal to the number of cards in our hand, and when it comes into play, we draw a card. And it transforms into a star star vigilance trample with power and toughness equal to the number of cards in all players' hands. Uh, honestly, unless you're playing a huge multiplayer game, its flip side just isn't that amazing. 
and its front side is very likely to die as we go into top deck mode fairly frequently with this deck. That is the creatures. Moving on to the other spells, we have Lightning Greaves because we want to give our creatures haste and shroud. Uh, pretty much a standard staple in Commander. Uh, Xenagos, the Reveler. Uh, it's mostly here for its plus one to just make a bunch of red and green mana. The ability to make a Seder is occasionally decent if we need a Chump Blocker, and its ultimate I actually find is quite lackluster in this build. He's mostly just here for his mana generation. Something similar can be said for Garuk Wildspeaker, as we mostly use him for his plus one to untap two target lands. Uh, but his Minus th his minus one to put out a 3-3 three, three, and his minus four to overrun aren't bad either, but again, I mostly use him for his plus. Zendikar Resurgent, I put in this deck over mana uh, reflection because it has the card draw engine built into it just when we cast creature spells, which has been super relevant for me in many games. And honestly, I don't need the actual doubling of mana the majority of the time. The plus one is more than sufficient. So here in this deck, I actually like this better than mana reflection. Uh, Rites of Flourishing. This is just kind of a fun card. I really do like politic-based games. So uh, allowing everyone to draw an additional card and play an additional land is quite a bit of fun. It makes them less likely to want to kill us off, and it allows us to just get some more card draw to refill our hand. Uh, Gaia's Anthem. Uh, Pumps our creatures 1-1. One, one. It's not super impressive, and I may end up getting the cut. It's just in here for some additional power. Halpack Resurgence, on the other hand, is great. For uh, two and a green enchantment with Flash, each creature we control that's a wolf or a werewolf gets 1-1 one, one and has Trample. It's almost as good as the next card, which is Full Moon's Rise. For one and a green, our werewolf, werewolf creatures get 1-1 and Trample, and we can sacrifice it to regenerate all of our creatures. Uh, this has allowed me to live through board wipes I had no right living through, and just steal games. Beastmaster Ascension is super sweet. Um, whenever creature we control attacks, we can put a quest counter on it. Uh, Whenever it has seven or more quest counters on it, our creatures get plus five, plus five. So once this thing goes online, it just wins the game. Wolf Caller's Howl, this is yet another card that's just super powerful in multiplayer. Uh, for three and a green, and it's an enchantment that says at the beginning of our upkeep, we get X22 green wolf tokens, where X is the number of opponents with four or more cards in hand. So the more opponents, the better. This is really great for multiplayer games, and especially when you're going up against those blue decks, or even those black decks that like to draw a lot or just use necro a lot. Uh, the Wolf Caller's Howl will get pretty much guaranteed to at least make us one 2-2 two, two green wolf token every turn, but at its best it can make us as much as three in a four-player game. Shamanic Revelation it just draws us a card for each creature we control and gains us four life for each creature we control power four or greater, so it can give us some life back. Harmonize just straight up draws us three cards. Moon Mist is the best fog we can hope for, also transforming our human werewolves and preventing all damage specifically dealt by non-wolves and werewolf creatures. So our creatures will still deal damage, theirs will not. Overwhelming Stampede is the best overrun effect we could hope for, giving our creatures plus X plus X and Trample, where X is the greatest power amongst creatures we control. Pairs pretty well with either of the changelings we have in the deck that just tend to get big. Kadama's Reach, as well as Cultivate, just go find more land for us. Survival of the Fittest, we can pay a green and uh, discard a creature, then go find any creature and put it into our hand. So we can just discard the cards we don't care about and go find the ones that we do at any point in time. Again, also available in Gold Border if you want to save some money. <laughs> um, Worldly Tutor is going to go find us a creature and put it on top of our library at some speed. Sylvan Tutor is going to do the same thing at sorcery speed. Gamble is going to go find us any card and put it on top, of, uh, put it in our hand, but then we discard a card at random, so it could end up screwing us over. Signal the clans, we just go and find our three best werewolves, or three best cards, uh, and hopefully get the one that we really, really want, but either way, we end up getting something decent out of it for only two uh, mana and instant speed. Fire Spot is a situational board wipe that can end up killing off creatures power uh, with toughness of three or less, uh, that have flying or non-flying, depending on how we choose to spend it, possibly both. Decimate blows up an artifact, creature, enchantment, and land. Sorry, Moonlight, you're good. Uh, Moonlight Hunt sure. costs one and a green for an instant. Um, it allows us to choose a creature we don't control and then have each of our wolves and werewolves deal damage equal to their power to that creature. Beast Within blows up any permanent and then gives its controller a 3 3 beast. Blasphemous Act will deal 13 damage to each creature and cost one less for each creature in play. Chaos Warp can tuck any permanent. Frozen Grip can destroy any enchantment or artifact and has split seconds. The Ancient Grudge can blow up any enchantment and flashback for a single green. Hope Reach blows up an enchantment and an artifact on our main phase. Or sorry, our enchantment and artifacts for source speed, uh, add source speed for only a red and a green. 
and our mutation can blow up an artifact and give us a bunch of sapperlings. So there we go. That's the deck tech for Arlen Cord. Hope you guys enjoyed.